When you meditate, you're making choices. For instance, right now you're choosing to be with a breath. And then you want to choose to make that choice stick. In other words, you don't just stay here for a little bit. For the meditation to work, you have to stick with it for a long time. This is where it's good to know some of the techniques for staying with the breath with a sense of confidence, with a sense of ease, that the breath feels good. Breathing in feels good, breathing out feels good. If it doesn't feel good, you can change the way you breathe. That's another choice you can make. Try long breathing, short breathing, fast, slow, heavy, light, deep, shallow, broad, narrow. Because the breath, the in and out breath, is connected with what they call the breath element throughout the body. There's a sense of energy that fills the whole body. In some cases it's blatant that there's movement, in other cases it's simply kind of a buzz. But without the energy, you'd be paralyzed. So think of the whole body as breath and see what that does. We're learning about the the power of the mind's choices, the perceptions it holds, the things it focuses on. Because we want to see how much our choices actually shape the way we, ch we experience things. There are a lot of things out there that we can write up to what other people are doing, what other people are thinking. But a lot of it has to do with our interpretive code, the way the mind reads things. And if you find that it's getting you worked up, it's creating unskillful habits, unskillful mind states, you can change. It's this power to change that the meditation is all about. In fact, the Buddha's teachings are all about the power of your choices. to change things. As he once said, if people couldn't develop skillful qualities or abandon unskillful ones, there would be no point in teaching them. But it's the fact that we can see that when you develop good qualities of mind, like goodwill, compassion, concentration, mindfulness, discernment, you get good results. and you abandon unskillful ones, you get good results too. And it's because you actually get results that that's why you find it worth teaching. Everything in his teaching revolves around the issue of choice, and of course choice comes together with his teachings on karma. Now in our culture, karma's got a bad rap because it's mainly associated with bad karma. But the Buddha's whole emphasis is that you can create good karma. You've got some good karma in the past already, otherwise you wouldn't be a human being. And you want to build on that. I remember my family who, when she first heard about karma, all she could think about were, oh my gosh, I'm going to get punished for the bad things I did in the past. That's why a lot of people react to it. But the Buddha never talked about punishment in that way. Karma, he, he said, it's what makes generosity worth a reality. And there are actually people in his time that said generosity is, is all is all sham. Because they were teaching that people had no choice. Whatever they did, they just did because that's the way it was written into the world, so you can't credit them with anything good or bad. That was their way of trying to get themselves off the hook for making good or bad choices. Or they would say there's really no person there anyhow that you could be generous with. It's all just physical elements. So it doesn't really matter if you help other people or not. And to this day, the, those attitudes are around. But one of the first things the Buddha said after he was, when he was teaching about karma was that there is generosity. And the meaning was it has a meaning. It has value. And it has value because we have this power of choice. 
The same with gratitude. When people have helped you, you should have gratitude for them because they made the choice. You know, again, if they didn't have any choice in the matter, it just was built into the way they were, there'd be no need for gratitude because they had, they had no choice in the matter. But when you realize that when people have helped you and gone out of their way, they had to choose to make some sacrifices. They had to choose to go out of the way to help you. And so it's worth showing them gratitude. That's a sign that you yourself appreciate goodness and you appreciate help. And the fact that we're meditating is directly related to the teaching on karma, too. Where does karma come from? It comes from our intentions. And where do our intentions come from? It comes from they come from the state of the mind. And so we're working on the state of the mind so we can improve our intentions to make them not just good, but skillful. Good is well-meaning. Skillful is not only well-meaning, but also checking up to see when you do an action, what are the results. And if something is you thought was good, but it turns out to get bad results, you go back and you recalibrate. It's that reading the results and then going back and using your experience to inform your intention. That's what turns good intentions into skillful ones. So when we think about karma and the karma of meditation, remember it's we're focusing on the good side. The fact that we can make a change for the better. And particularly in our own minds, because you look in the mind and it's a huge mess of all kinds of intentions. And if you bring more mindfulness and more alertness and more concentration and discernment to it, you begin to straighten things out. You can see where your inner worlds, the worlds of the ideas that you inhabit, are pulling you off in the wrong direction. And you can replace them with better ones. Which better one? As I said last night, the, the world of being a meditator, sitting here, being aware of what's going on, being aware of what's going on in your mind, what's going on in the breath, with a sense of well-being based on the breath. That's a good place to step out. And the mindfulness you bring here, it's important to understand mindfulness is not just bare awareness. It's the ability to hold something in mind, to keep something in mind. And one of the things you want to keep in mind is that you do have the power of choice. We had this chance read just now in reflecting on the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Those are things you want to keep in mind as well. The Buddha represents our ability to, with our own efforts, find true happiness. Of course, he's also there as, as he said, our friend, that he's shown the way. There's that famous passage where Ananda comes to him and says that having admirable friends is half of the life of the practice, what they called half of the holy life. And the Buddha said, no, it's the whole of the practice. And that doesn't mean our Admiral friends are going to do it all for us, but it simply means that they've shown us the way. And they've set a good example. And you want to keep their example in mind, that this is something human beings can do. Because you notice in the worlds of your mind that tend to be unskillful, the possibility that you could change for the better is just not entertained at all. If you'd see, you know, who else is inhabiting that particular world? And if there's room for the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha, in other words, the example that they set, okay, it's going to be a good world. But if there's no room for them, if you blot them out, in other words, what they represent is the possibility of training the mind to a point of total freedom. And all our unskillful states don't like total freedom. They like their slavery to greed or aversion or delusion. And so they put on blinders. They pretend that the, the Buddha never gained awakening. The Dharma's not there. The Sangha, they pretend, has 
not been here all along to show us a good example, to show that it's not just somebody 2,500 years ago, but it's a path that is still alive today, is still possible today. See, so look at the mental worlds you're inhabiting. Try to make sure that the world you inhabit has space for the example of the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha. This is why we have them as recollections. And if you find yourself focused on a desire or focused in a particular mental world and there's no space for the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha there, okay, you're in trouble. That world is going to close in on you. Another quality you want to look for in a good mental world is what the Buddha calls shame and compunction. Now, shame doesn't mean you feel that you're a bad person. It simply means when you think about doing something unskillful, you have a sense of shame around it. They said, this is beneath me. I'm a better person than that. And that's the kind of pride that's really helpful and really healthy. As for compunction, you see that you would do something and it would have bad consequences, and you say, those bad consequences matter. I'm not going to do it. Now, there's a sense of pride that goes with that. It's a healthy sense of pride. It's what protects you and protects your worlds. So again, if you find yourself in a particular middle world and you don't notice any sense of shame at all, you can do anything at all. No sense of compunction to get apathetic because it doesn't matter what I do or what the consequences are, who gets hurt. Okay, know that you're in a bad world. And try to use the breath, use the meditation to get out. Because again, you can choose the worlds that you inhabit. And the meditation here is to give you the tools you need in order to make that choice wise and to make it stick. So as you're mindful of the breath, try to keep the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha there in that world as well. To remind you that you've got lots of potentials. This is what the teaching about karma is all about, is that you've got great potential. This could be the potential for good or potential for harm. They say that a John Sow's main Dharma talk theme was always that human beings have the highest potential of any being in the world, the highest potential for good, the highest potential for evil. So make your choices wisely. And the instructions and meditation techniques and all the other teachings are there to provide you the tools. This is the Buddha's gift to us. And the Sangha has maintained this gift over the centuries. So always make sure that you're inhabiting the world that they're inhabiting as well. Because it's there that your potential for good can really grow.